So thank you all for coming tonight. I'm Annetta, I'm the curator of Odd Salon and tonight's curator for Hoax. Uh, this is a topic that has been in the running since our very first year and I can't believe it, we're in the, the middle of our uh, fourth year, which is amazing. I'm kind of astonished. Um, especially that we've, we've gone so long without having this particular one. Um, so I'm really excited to, to have tonight's uh, fellows heavy talk presentation this evening. Um, before we get started, I, we'd like to ask and welcome everyone who is new to Odslan tonight. So uh, raise your hand if this is your first visit to Odslan. Everyone else, join me in welcoming them. Thank you all for coming tonight. I want to let you know real quick how this works. We're going to have six short talks um, interrupted by a cocktail break. If you don't have a cocktail in your hand, I encourage you to get one. We raise a lot of toasts. Um, our speakers at Odd Salon are experts and enthusiastic amateurs. We welcome everyone to this stage, which means that if you have an interesting idea for an upcoming theme, we welcome you to join us. We have one new speaker tonight. We try and have at least one, if not two new speakers in every salon. Um, so we encourage you to join us. You can do that um, by going to our website and you can go to odd salon forward slash speak. There's a button right on the homepage and you can submit your idea for any of our upcoming talks or just an idea that you have in general that you think might work out for us. Um, in the meantime, while you're here tonight, please make a little bit of noise. We like to have an enthusiastic audience. There are some callbacks that you'll find really quickly. Um, and we also encourage you to tweet. We live tweet all of our shows. And uh, if you hashtag us or, or mention us, we'll chat back at you. So please feel free to join the conversation in the sort of secondary channels. And then I'd like to start things off by uh, talking about some of my favorite hoaxes. And so in order to frame this, I want to introduce you to Jeff, Mary, and the Bonsai Kittens, still available as a band name as far as I know. Um, so these are just really, really quickly, and sort of stepping backwards in the timeline. Once upon a time, there was a lady named Mary, and she was the mother to rabbits. She's a real person, her name was Mary Toft, and in 1726 in England, she gave birth to a series of very strange creatures. According to the story, what followed was that she, while she was pregnant with her fourth child, she was in the field working, and she spotted a rabbit, and became so entranced with the sight of this rabbit that she chased this rabbit, and she miscarried. But after this miscarriage, she had a miracle. She gave birth to a sordid, parts of animals. There was the leg of a tabby cat, there was a spine of an eel, but then there was a whole series of rabbits. None of them were living and most of them were not whole rabbits. Uh, this here is, I think, if you're going to go down in history, it, it, you can't really do much worse than getting illustrated by Hogarth, even if it is making fun of you. This is a Hogarth illustration of the Mary Toft uh, court case. Um, so. It's an interesting story, this miraculous birth to a whole bunch of like weird animal parts and rabbits, but it's not like she did this alone and it wasn't, it wasn't just reported by hearsay. She was attended by excellent physicians. Uh, she was attended by John Howard, who was the first person to really call attention to this. He wrote his own pamphlet on the phenomenon and he called in uh, somebody named Nathaniel St. Andre, who was the Swiss physician to the king, as well as a guy named John Mowbray, who was another English physician. And he was really well known. He was a male midwife at the time and he he had published several tracts on uh, childbirth and he had this theory that was, it wasn't a new theory, it was a theory that had been around for a long time. It's a concept called maternal impressions and that's basically the idea that the thoughts, emotions and dreams of a pregnant woman can impact uh, the nature of, of her pregnancy and the outcome of birth. But he took it one step further and implied um, that the emotions attached to animals can create animal-like mutations in the child uh, of an un, of an un, uh, of, as an as yet unborn child, uh, basically blaming mutations on the mother. Um, in additionally, that he also thought that there was a small creature, a small mouse-like creature called a pseudokind that some women just you know sometimes had as as children. <laughs> the press ate it up. The attending doctors rushed to press. There were several different pamphlets written about the miraculous birth of rabbits, and their version made it out in, into, the popular, into the popular mind. It was a miracle. Let's jump forward. I'd like you to meet Jeff. 
Um, much more recently, in the fall of 1931 on the Isle of Man, a little girl met a talking mongoose. <laughs> At first, the Irving family, living in a semi-remote farmhouse, heard whispering and clawing in the walls, but soon the mysterious voices manifested, identifying itself as belonging to Jeff, an extra clever Indian mongoose hailing from New Delhi who was more than 100 years old. He told stories, he sang songs, he chased mice at the farm, and he ate bananas and biscuits that the family left out at night for him. He became a tabloid sensation, not just in 1931, but throughout the 1930s, despite the fact that no one really got a really good solid look at him. And he wasn't just an average conversationalist. Jeff was like a really, really good conversationalist. He made some bold proclamations like, I am a freak, I have hands and feet, and if you saw me, you'd faint. You'd be petrified, mummified, turned to stone or a pillar of salt. Or, I split the atom, I'm the fifth dimension, I am the eighth wonder of the world. <laughs> That's strong stuff. So he may have been a talker, but he remained elusive. Uh, he hid in the walls and the shadows of the family home. This quote unquote remarkable photograph is the best documentation we have of Jeff, despite years of press attention, but nonetheless, still absolutely a miracle. Jumping forward. Bonsai kittens, barely yesterday. At the beginning of the internet, I know, they're adorable. Look at that little face. It's, it's so squishy and perfectly formed. So Bonsai Kittens is now sort of fondly remembered as one of the internet's first, first really solid hoaxes. It debuted in 2000 on the baby internet. Um, and it was purporting to be a website with instructions dedicated to reviving the lost art of making bonsai kittens by forming them into decorative shapes, softening their bones, and super gluing them into bottles. People went completely bananas. PETA was called, the Humane Society got involved, the website was taken down angrily and then mirrored and then taken down and then mirrored and then taken down several times. Uh, it was probably not a miracle. But here's the thing, you would think that maybe with modern technology, we would stop being a sucker. But we, there's a truism across time, and what tonight's stories sort of tell us is that nothing has really changed. So what the hell is going on? What's going on, brain? Why do we not cotton on to these things? Why don't we catch on? And there's a few things that are going on. And first and most importantly, we fundamentally, at a very primal level, want to believe. We are really, really good at pattern recognition, and when confronted with things that don't quite fit, we kind of force the issue and we use intuition to fill in the gaps. And when that pattern doesn't make sense, we leap to conclusions. And we've shown over and over and over again in studies that we are consistently really bad at resisting the urge to jump to those conclusions even when we don't know the answers. And we also have a really big problem with the, the concept of correlation does not equal causation. We just do not get this over and over and over again. <laughs> and it's really, it's an attempt to avoid cognitive dissonance. It's a very uncomfortable feeling to hold two facts in conflict in our mind. And so in order to, to resolve that feeling of tension, we try and find intuitive solutions that make enough sense for us to move on to the next thing without destroying our worldview. So if we see one thing happening, and another thing also happening, we have an innate tendency to decide that there's a connection between the two of them and find the connection even when it's not really there. And this is a path to magical thinking which can lead to all kinds of problems. Um, it is that idea that just because that one time you rubbed a rap uh, lucky rabbit's foot, something good happened, that it happened because you rubbed the magic foot, not and you rubbed the, magic, the rabbit's foot. And these things work for us because it calms us the fuck down. It creates a nice sense of security and a known world order. The world works this way, and I get it. And hoaxes appeal to that part of our brain by supplying an unlikely scenario, but reasonably gathered patterns. And because we want to understand the world around us, we have an unfortunate tendency to accept these things, even ridiculous things, as long as they meet that minimum criteria for plausibility that we have established through our pattern recognition. The minimum seems to be this formula. You need an incredible happening, but to an ordinary person with a seemingly credible witness. The more convincing details, better, um, and then th 
the best thing, the best thing you can possibly have, and I think the thing that you see consistently through most of the stories that uh, you'll hear tonight, is that the press is covering it. So you have an outside arbiter discovering the story, not just the witnesses themselves telling their own story. And with that combination, the brain just seems to default to a happy place. Like, sure, fine, it's okay, seems legit. And this formula, this relationship between the trickster and the gullible masses plays out through folklore and fairy tales and it forms the basis for all of our cautionary tales. It's a, re a repeated motif over and over again to be careful of who and what you believe. Don't be a sucker because it is so easy for us to be one. So, so common. And of course, there are some people who are more prey to this than other people. And there are two sort of elements that come into play. One is credulity and one is gullibility. And credulity is the ability or the general willingness to accept something, remarkable or not, just even ordinary things, but without even seeking a plausible explanation. Uh, this can actually be changed. This is a learned behavior, and we can learn to be better about this by applying a reasonable bound of, amount of rational thought and skepticism to our thought process. This can be thought of as like the base state, whereas gullibility requires somebody doing manipulating. It requires the hoaxer pulling the strings and trying to convince you of something, and we are all gullible. We are all gullible even when we think that we have appropriate skepticism and rational thought because of that pattern recognition, and all of us have a little bit, just enough magic thinking to get led astray if we don't try and stop ourselves. And these flaws can do a few good things. This, this magical thinking allows us to have the placebo effect. It allows us to find joy at knowing you are getting fooled in stage illusions. It lowers our stress palpably to be able to sort of think that we understand how that card trick works that we absolutely don't understand. Um, and without a certain amount of belief in the impossible, innovation and creativity would, be with, uh, would wither. But at the same time, it leaves you open to be taken advantage of by hucksters peddling snake oil and faith healing. Or you can destroy the credibility of your entire career by, by backing a series of ludicrous fairy photographs, uh, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. <laughs> so I want to return to these guys, which of course are all hoaxes. Um, exploiting these vulnerabilities that we all have. Mary's husband was caught in December of the same year that she started giving birth to rabbits in October, uh, buying rabbits on the down low and sneaking them literally into Mary. Uh, what is perhaps most remarkable about Mary's story is not even that this hoax went down or that people believed she was giving birth to rabbits, is that she did not die immediately of some horrible infection. And she actually went on to survive long enough to go to prison for about a year, get released, and have more children, which is a very healthy constitution Mary had. <laughs> very impressive. Um, on the Isle of Man, it turned out that the Irving daughter uh, was a suspiciously good ventriloquist. And also the family in general seemed to have a, a sense of play and rather like the attention. And they just kept the story going long enough until people sort of gradually lost interest. Bonsai kittens are absolutely definitely real because it's on the internet. And right now out there, there is somebody who is discovering it for the first time and is totally outraged. Outraged, it is unacceptable. How dare you, sir? Uh, um, so all of these things sort of prey on our imperfect brains. So are they not delightful stories? Like I think they're delightful stories, but are they terrible? Are they horrible things? Should we be outraged? Why do we love the stories of the tricksters and the history of hoaxes? And I have a theory about that. And my theory is that hoaxes rattle the cage of magical thinking. All of those studies that look at the, at the ways that we have a hard time telling what's true about our overactive pattern recognition and our failures in critical thinking show that there's a way to help prime our brain to look for a scam. And it's not very complicated. The answer is to tell us to look for them. So I think we love these stories of tricksters and hoaxes because they prime us to look out, to question what we know, to seek the causation instead of the correlation, to fact check and gather and gather resources rather than use our deeply flawed intuition and take things for granted, to instead dare to know. And so I would like to begin this evening by raising the first glass with a little invocation that I think goes to potential hoaxers and innovators alike 
which is only those who attempt the absurd can achieve the impossible from Einstein to the absurd.